Okay, everybody, when is a science fiction movie so good you forget you're watching a science fiction movie? Well, that is what you're going to get today. Let's go. All right, everybody, we're taking a look back at 1979's Time After Time. My God, this is one of the greatest science fiction motion pictures ever, bar none. It's in the pantheon of great flicks. But before we go any further and dig into this baby, we're going, as always, to the trailer. The time is 1893, and novelist and inventor H.G. Wells makes a startling announcement. Yes, gentlemen. I am talking about traveling through time in a machine constructed for that very purpose. The first to use the machine, however, is Dr. John Leslie Stevenson, <laughs> better known to history as Jack the Ripper. And what was to be a voyage of discovery in an instant becomes a manhunt through time from 19th century England to 20th century San Francisco. Certainly, certainly. You were literally the last person on Earth I expected to see. You've given me quite a turn. I'm obliged to take you back to face the consequences of your acts. You take me back. How do you propose to do that? By force? Be reasonable, John. We don't belong here. A 19th century gentleman. Are you quite certain I'm not forcing you to do anything that you're regret? Forcing me? And a 20th century woman. My God, Herbert, I'm practically raping you. Yeah, that's true. Join forces to capture a criminal from the past at large in the modern world. But even more than they want him, he needs them. You throw me the key and I'll release the girl. On your honor, John, you have my word as a gentleman. Now, there's just one thing. I would have expected that you'd notice by now that I am not a gentleman. Say goodbye. Goodbye, Herbert. You haven't instructed him in the use of one of these machines, have you? Checkmate, and you've lost again. A romantic adventure, a breathless chase around the world and across a century. Time after time. Okay, everybody, this motion picture was directed by Nicholas Meyer. He is a master director and a master writer, and he directed one of my favorite motion pictures of all times. So I'm talking one of my top five easily, without a doubt, and that is Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That thing was phenomenal and a masterpiece. But he's done other things. He did Star Trek VI, The Other Discovered Country, which was just amazing. Uh, he did uh, Volunteers and The Deceivers and, and Company Business, and he directed TV stuff like that classic end of the world motion picture the day after so nicholas meyer top 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 level director man he should have been bigger anyway i whatever also another fact is he fought for david warner in this movie because the studio wanted mick jagger and jesus god almighty thank god nick meyer had the balls to fight for david warner Okay, playing H.G. Wells is Malcolm McDowell. Come on, man. I'm a huge Malcolm McDowell fan. This guy's been in so many legendary movies, so many classics. He's also been in about 30, 40, 50 pieces of complete shit. But whatever. He's been in some of the best shit ever, man. We're talking he was in A Clockwork Orange. We're talking he was in Caligula. He was in stuff like uh, uh, Voyage of the Damned, The Passage. Uh, Halloween 2007 and uh, Cross Creek and Moon 44 and Class of 99 and uh, Milk Money and Tank Girl and uh, uh, I just reviewed him not that long ago one of my all-time favorites Blue Thunder and he was in one of my all-time legendary favorites 
cat people. Malcolm McDowell, top level, just the way it goes, fucking legend. Okay, playing John Stevenson. David Warner. Oh, come on, man, this guy's such top-notch shit, man. I mean, beyond the fact that he, he was also in another Nicholas Meyer movie, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, which is fucking phenomenal in its own right. He was in a bunch of stuff. He was in which a movie I'm going to review at one point or another called Nightwing, which I love. But he was also in uh, uh, Titanic and, and Tron and In the Mouth of Madness and The Omen and uh, Cross of Iron, uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, The Fixer, uh, Wing Commander, uh, Mary Poppins Returns, uh, the, the 2001 version of Planet of the Apes, uh, eight quadrillion TV shows. David Warner is fucking awesome. I'm swearing too much. I'm sorry. Okay, let's go to the next one. Playing Amy Robbins. Mary Steen Virgin. Been around a long time, folks. Been in a lot of good stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, she was in this, obviously. She was in Cross Creek and, and uh, Ragtime and Going South, which was a really, really cool forgotten movie, and uh, Melvin and Howard, and uh, Step Brothers, and you know, uh, Parenthood, and uh, Dead of Winter, and Miss Firecracker, and uh, 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 Powder, The Proposal, uh, uh, the, the Butcher's Wife. Long, 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 crazy long career. Been in a million things. Legendary actress. All you need to know. Okay, playing Lieutenant Mitchell was Charles Gioffi. Now, he's one of those names that you're never going to remember, you're never going to know, but you'll recognize his face. He was in this. He was in stuff like uh, Clute and Shaft and uh, Lucky Luciano and The Thief Who Came to Dinner, uh, The Accuser, uh, 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 Get Christy Love and, and Ryan's Hope and, uh, you know, Another World and Simon and Simon and he was on The X-Files and all that kind of shit. So, big career, long career around for a long, 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 long time and a whole, whole, whole bunch of shit. So, Charles Kioffi, give him props. Okay, playing Shirley, Patty D. Abnerville. Now, she had a career that is really long and really varied. She was in a whole bunch of stuff. She was in this, she was in stuff like uh, uh, The House and The Main Event with Rhino Needle and, uh, you know, Barbara Streisand and Hog Wild and uh, The Fan and uh, TV shows like uh, Wise Guy and Another World and uh, South Beach, uh, L.A. Law. And she was in a movie that I'm going to review because it's so forgotten and so criminally overlooked and so fucking stupid. And that was Modern Problems with Chevy Chase. A complete, classic, goofy, weird, odd movie that sooner or later I'll get around to reviewing. Okay, everybody, I'm going to try to do this in 90 seconds or less. You know I love to fly through the story just so I can get to why I really love the movie. And I don't like to give you too much anyway because I want you to discover it on your own. You know the routine. Anyway, here's the story. H.G. Wells, famous writer, he's hanging out with his boys, having a good night, and he's showing them his greatest triumph. He built a time machine. I shit you not. Anyway, they're hanging out. Next thing you know, the police are at the door. Dick, 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 dick. Dick, dick. They think that uh, fucking Jack the Ripper might be in there. They've, yeah, they've got some stuff. They got some clues. They got some shit. Anyway, he takes a look around. One of his boys is missing. Who's missing? John Leslie Stevenson, his closest friend, his dearest buddy. He goes downstairs and realizes that he has escaped to the future in his very time machine. Well, you know, he has to do what he has to do. So he hops in the time machine and goes to the very place that John Stevenson went to, which happens to be 1979, California. Hey, is what it is. Anyway, he shows up there and he starts going on the trail of John Stevenson. He finds out that he went to a bank to change in some cash from then to cash. Well, I hate to say now because it was 1979. That's fucking like 40 years ago. Anyway, he gets some money and that connects him to Mary Steenburgen. Amy. And they start a relationship, they get a thing going, and he winds up tracking them down, and there's chases and all kinds of shit. Whatever. It doesn't matter. This motion picture is phenomenal, and we're going to get to why I think so. Okay, everybody. This motion picture is so 
well done on so many levels. I'm going to try to hit everything and tell you why this motion picture is so great. Yes, it was directed excellently by Nicholas Meyer. There's shots in it that are so beautiful and so gorgeous to look at. And it's done so concisely tight. It's thrilling. It's a thrill ride. And I don't know how the hell Nicholas Meyer didn't become a bigger director than he did. Yeah, he did this, and this is classic. Yes, he did Star Trek II, and that's fucking classic. Yes, he even did Star Trek VI, and that is classic. But I don't know how he didn't hit the levels of like a Steven Spielberg or something like that, because this guy had all the tools, all the talent. He had the writing ability and the directing ability. He should have been a legend. Anyway, past the directing part of this motion picture, you have the acting part of this motion picture. This motion picture is acted so well by everybody in it. David Warner is playing Jack the Ripper, and he is so, oh my God, he's so perfect in the role. You see this guy who's kind of like, you know, he's elegant, but he's evil, and he's mischievous, and he's almost tortured, and he wraps it all up into one character and delivers it so precisely that you are glued to the TV every time you see him. He is just magnificent in this role. Then you have Malcolm McDowell, who always played a heavy, and still after this, a lot of times played a heavy, whether it was Blue Thunder or Cat People, or whatever the fuck it was, he always played a brooding, dark character. I mean, he's shit, even when he popped up in Star Trek Generations. But in this, he plays the exact opposite, and he plays it perfectly. He plays this almost whimsical, dreamer-like, innocent, childlike character in H.G. Wells. And when you see him transported from 1893 to 1979, he does it effortlessly. He does it perfectly. He does that acting job to the highest level it can be done. You believe everything that you see him doing. You believe the shock in his face when he sees, you know, airplanes and shit on TV or whatever it is. He does it so well in this motion picture. And Mary Steenburgen, she kicks it out the park too. She plays a slightly detached, aloof, weird 70s California girl that is just a little bit, I don't know, a little bit odd, a little bit goofy, a little bit space casey. But she does it so well that she's so believable that those three characters alone, yes, there's others in the movie that also do well, but those three jobs by those three main actors is phenomenal. In the way this motion picture was written, there is such Okay, I'm going to give you the two reasons why this thing works. One, the friendship between John Stevenson, Jack the Ripper, and H.G. Wells is intact throughout the movie. And that's what's one of the things that is just bizarre and amazing about this thing. You can see the caring and the love between these two guys, even though H.G. Wells realizes that Stevenson is Jack the River. Even though Stevenson realizes he has to do whatever he can to get away from H.G. Wells. There's moments when they're together in this motion picture when you can just see the friendship is still there and the caring is still there. But in a way, the loathing is now there. And there's all kinds of shit. And it's played so well and written so well. It is magnificent. Just the scene alone, by the way, we're in the hotel room and the television set and, and Stevenson is now showing... H.G. Wells, what the world is like, and he's he's horrified, and he can't believe, because he was always an optimist that the world would be a better place, and now he sees that it's become an even more violent place. That scene alone would pull this movie all the way through and make it worth watching. <sighs> what can you say? Another thing about this motion picture, you never really know what's going to happen all the way through it. You don't. Is Mary Steenburgen, Amy, going to get it? Is she going to get away? Is she going to die? Is he going to get away? Is it, it's not one of those movies you feel like you're going into the last 20 minutes of it saying, I know where this shit's going. I know what's going to happen. I know. You really don't know what's going to happen. You really don't know what's going to take place. And that, and that is brilliant directing and brilliant writing. And it's so well crafted. Oh, man, you're on your edge of your seat right up until the last fucking second. Okay, everybody, <laughs> go out and watch Time After Time. I know it's not one of the little low-budget jammers that I like to throw out there a lot, but it's one of those motion pictures that sometimes gets criminally forgotten, and I, I don't know how. A phenomenal motion picture directed by a phenomenal director and starring a phenomenal cast. <sighs> and by the way, 
One other thing too, even though this motion picture is 1979, it feels timeless. When you watch that movie today, you don't feel like you're watching something dated. So if you're a younger person watch this, don't say, oh, it's an old flick from God knows when, it's gonna feel silly. No, this motion picture feel like, feels like it could be happening right now, today. It doesn't feel dated, it doesn't feel out of its time. It's a great masterpiece of cinema. All right, folks, that's it. I gotta go, I'm out of here, got things to do. Anyway, check this motion picture out, enjoy it, love it, take it in. It's worth every friggin' second of your time. Till we see you again, peace out.